Okay, good morning, everybody. My name is Sarah Ladislaw. I'm the director and senior fellow here at the Energy and National Security Program, and I would like to welcome all of you to this morning's session, uh, where we're going to focus on the role of carbonate fuel cells in carbon capture and storage. We're really excited about uh, this, the discussion this morning. We were talking a little bit before, and actually it came up in one of the sessions we were holding uh, last week, uh, about the need to sort of focus again on the role that carbon capture and sequestration uh, plays on, in the pathways, uh, low carbon pathways uh, going forward in our energy future. And it just so happens that ExxonMobil and, uh, and uh, fuel cell, uh, excuse me, Fuel Cell Energy, uh, had come out with an announcement not too long ago uh, about the work they intended to do together. And so we're really pleased to have the opportunity today to talk a little bit about uh, what that work is going to be, uh, both from a technical uh, perspective, but also in how it fits into the broader suite of uh, technology solutions uh, that might help uh, in terms of uh, advancing our interest in both providing affordable and reliable energy supplies, but doing it in a way uh, that respects the environment and deals with the issue of climate change. We've got two uh, speakers speakers here this morning to uh, uh, sort of uh, talk a little bit about the joint partnership uh, that Exxon and Fuel Cell have uh, launched together. Uh, the first is Vijay uh, Swarup, who is uh, the Vice President in Research and Development at Exxon Mobil's Research and Engineering Company. Uh, you have his bio in front of you, but I definitely commend you to take a look at all of the really interesting and neat things that uh, Dr. Swarup has done uh, over the course of uh, his time uh, at Exxon. Uh, and, uh, and with him is uh, Chip Batone, who's the President and Chief Executive Officer at Fuel Cell Energy, Inc., uh, a company that's done a lot of really interesting things in the fuel cell space in their own right, uh, and is going to talk a little bit about the partnership that they have endeavored to create uh, together. Um, I would uh, remind everybody today's conversation is uh, on the record and being webcast, so when it does come to our conversation part of the discussion, please use the microphones and state your name and affiliation so that everybody can understand who's participating in today's conversation. Um, what we're going to do is have a bit of a presentation for about 30 minutes, uh, talk a little bit about what uh, what the plan is, uh, what the technology is, and, and, and what the potential is for what it promises to deliver, uh, and then I'll have a little bit of a discussion uh, uh, with uh, the gentleman, and then we'll open it up for discussion. So thanks very much for being here, and whichever one of you wants to start. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, everybody. On behalf of uh, VJ and myself, uh, welcome to our discussion. And uh, as Sarah said, we'll, we'll have some uh, materials to present, but we do uh, look forward to the Q&A period. Uh, I think we have ample time to uh, take your questions. So with that, I would just, um, the next uh, slide, uh, give you an overview of what we're going to talk about. It'll probably take about uh, 25 or 30 minutes. Um, VJ will talk a little bit about Exxon and the work that they're doing in this field. Uh, he'll turn it back to me and we'll talk about what Fuel Cell Energy is doing in this field. Uh, and then we'll go into the kind of the meat of the conversation, which is really what is this technology, what is carbon capture, and we'll touch on sequestration because there is a match here. It's, it's really CCS, which is carbon capture and sequestration. Um, and then we'll just kind of summarize, and then we'll move into uh, our Q&A. Um, but just before we leave the agenda page, for those of you that might be new to what fuel cells are, um, the picture on the slide there, the top one anyway, um, is actually a carbonate fuel cell. Um, it looks like, um, if, if I want to be uh, um, pretty simple here, it looks like a giant radiator. But that giant radiator, as you can see from the people standing there, um, is pretty, pretty tall. Um, there's about 400 different cells, and then that's what we call a stack. And that stack then goes into the middle picture where we stack these things vertically. And then ultimately, what those do is they, they put a, we put a cover on them, which is that white box at the bottom. And then that device um, is what actually takes in the CO2 from a coal or gas-fired power plant, which is, which is what we're going to talk about here today, and pollute, uh, produces electricity, either from clean natural gas or from biogas. And that's, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the nature of our business, but it looks kind of a simple device. It looks like uh, a big piece of metal. It is, but I want to trust that uh, it's uh, a very well designed and a pretty high tech device that basically allows us to produce power and do this absorption and concentration of CO2 in a, um, um, rather than a mechanical way, um, in, in more of a chemical way. Okay. So with that, I'll let the uh, next slide there and turn over to VJ. Off, I turn this on. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to speak with you. Um, 
this is this is one of my favorite places to visit this Washington DC area and, and and we're really excited to talk about this about this technology the the carbonate fuel cell and its role in carbon capture uh, we are going to sp speak mostly to the carbon capture side of this this uh, this uh, fuel cell is a very very unique way to concentrate co2 and that's what we're going to talk about we'll get into the chemistry at a high level and we'll get into how this differentiates itself versus other technologies in just a moment but a little bit about us uh, exxon mobil's experience in ccs uh, we've been studying this uh, for a long time we've had uh, r d in this space for several years in fact we've been working with chips team uh, almost five years now um, so we've been at this uh, uh, for a while, and uh, what drove us to uh, going a little more external is we, we did enough of the bench scale, very small scale laboratory work, to show the feasibility of the carbonate fuel cell being able to concentrate CO2. And we wanted to take it to the next level of research, and that next level of research often includes collaboration. And it's taking our skill set, we have several hundred PhDs in Clinton, New Jersey, which is our center for research, uh, but we don't have all the skills. And so uh, targeted leveraging is, is what we do. And fuel cell energy provides uh, the skill set in the fuel cell and the composition of the fuel cell, which we'll talk about more in a moment, uh, that allows this partnership, we hope, to take this technology to the next step. Early days, optimistic, uh, lots more research to go, but we're very excited. Uh, we, of course, have experience in carbon capture and sequestration. I think you're familiar with it. We have about a third of the world's capacity, uh, a little under 7 million tons of uh, CO2 captured and sequestered alone um, last year. Uh, we have a portfolio approach to this. So while we're talking today about the carbonate fuel cell and its role in carbon capture, we have several other active programs in our R&D portfolio. And quite frankly, we continue to look for more ideas. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is an area where solutions are required. And uh, we're, we're excited about this as a potential solution, but we're also humble enough to know that there are more solutions needed. And so we continue to research in this space um, and, uh, and are optimistic about this. But again, uh, uh, several years of research here. This actually came about by one of our scientists uh, uh, reading about this over a weekend, quite frankly, because researchers never stop researching. And uh, he said, wow, maybe we could look at this thing in terms of carbon capture. We'll to talk about how we configure this in a moment. And that led to the R&D program, which has led us uh, to where we are today. So we're very excited to be here. We're very uh, excited to be talking in a moment, and we'll get into some of the details on the carbon capture. I'll turn it over to Chip to talk about fuel cell. We have to coordinate our button pushing here, so that's what we're doing here, <laughs> looking at each other. Um, so thank you, VJ. Um, so just a little bit about fuel cell energy, um, for those of you who don't know who we are, and, and we've changed uh, pretty dramatically over the last several years, but our business is the supply, recovery, and storage of energy. Um, I'll talk about what those pictures are on, uh, on your left, I guess, in just a moment. But we, we basically build power plants. Uh, around the world in, um, in, in all three continents. Uh, we have about 50 installations of these globally with some of the world's leading companies. Exxon, obviously, uh, people like Eon and others, as well as some uh, of the major countries that focus on R&D and things like that. The company itself started about 40 years ago. We've been a public company traded on the NASDAQ for about 20 years. We have about 600 people uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the company. We're based in Connecticut. So we started out as a research company on carbon and fuel cells and things like that, and then over time uh, moved into a commercial um, uh, enterprise, which really hooked us up with, with Exxon, and there'll be more on that later. Um, again, we have operations and uh, manufacturing across the world. Um, when we had the opportunity, as VJ said, to work with, with, uh, with Exxon, um, we have a lot of uh, great people in our company, um, but I'll tell you, when you have the opportunity to work with the leaders in the field that you're in, that's always been our strategy and dream, because one of the things we, we believe is that we can learn from what other people do, and other people have different strengths than we have. So we're very proud of our company, but we also appreciate working with some of the best in the world, and that's what we have here. Um, what's interesting about this, uh, I get this sometimes, is you know why now? You've been around for 40 years, you've been a public company for 20, uh, you make power plants, you know, what's unique about this and why now? Um, and as Vijay said, the, 
the, the technology to basically concentrate CO2 um, you know, has been around. That's, that's what we do every day when we make power. That's what's kind of uh, interesting about this. It's a common technology platform to do what we're proposing to do as well as what we've been doing for the last 20 years. Um, so we've got billions of kilowatt hours on this technology on how we basically concentrate the CO2. And if you get into some other aspects of this, um, this is American innovation. Um, we do have business relationships around the globe, but uh, as Exxon does, we, we want to look at solving some of the bigger problems in the world. We want to make sure that we have the proper IP protection because what that does is um, uh, it allows us then to create opportunities both economically and uh, in, uh, with the, not just here but elsewhere with export opportunities. A little bit more about our experience. Um, we have had programs uh, with the Department of Energy and to give credit uh, when it's due, uh, many of the things that we have to talk about today uh, are um, really helped uh, tremendously because of the commitment and effort made by the Department of Energy across multiple uh, different parts of the Department of Energy, but particularly the fossil, the fossil folks uh, that supported us in this particular effort. Uh, we've been working on uh, carbon capture for the last several years, as VJ said. Um, that was originally on our side um, driven by the Department of Energy looking at some of these ways and how to concentrate CO2 in an affordable way. Um, and um, we, we've done a lot of different work and we have a recent project which we'll talk about um, in a minute here once VJ uh, finishes with his uh, further comments about what we're doing in the near term to uh, continue to refine um, both the technology part of this but the affordability of this carbon capture solution. Okay, so let's talk just a moment about sort of long-term stabilization and the, and the pathway or a potential pathway uh, to get there. Obviously, um, it starts with what we do today. And there is a, a need to have be more efficient, reduce demand. That, that comes in a variety of forms. That comes from lightweighting plastics that can make cars more efficient. It comes from uh, utilizing uh, 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 you know, more uh, efficient use, less use, uh, the, the change in the light bulbs, the hybridization of cars, all those things help today. Uh, but we know that more is needed. And so you get to the middle block and now you start thinking about, well, how, how do you go to decarbonization? How, how does that actually occur? Well, there's things that, that again, it's a, it's a journey. And so step one could be just going from coal to natural gas, less carbon intensive. Uh, uh, sources, and certainly natural gas provides that. Ultimately, you'll have to go to things like nuclear and wind and solar. And a big piece of this is going to be in all the, in, in these processes is you're going to have to do something with the CO2. And of course, that's where the CO2 capture and sequestration uh, comes in. Longer term, uh, most believe that negative greenhouse gas emissions is going to be needed. Um, at some point, um, later in the century, we'd actually have to turn negative. And a way to model that is shown on the right here, where we show um, forestation, lots of trees. Um, those trees then become wood chips, wood biomass. That biomass can, can, be, can be converted to energy, but of course that energy is going to be in the form of burning the um, biomass, which is, going to, which is going to create CO2, which is then going to create a CO2 uh, sequestration uh, challenge um, to be able to not just capture the CO2, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. This is CO2 is typically at atmospheric pressures, low concentrations. It is not the easiest thing to concentrate. And so again, this particular topic today is around the CO2 concentration, but to get to that ultimate decarbonization or negative GHG, you're going to have to take that CO2 from even from the wood or the biomass and concentrate it and then sequester it. So three steps, we have to take action today. We're taking action today in terms of more efficient uses. We have to think about how you go to the decarbonized uh, system and then ultimately to a negative emissions uh, system which, uh, and carbon capture and sequestration will play a role along that entire journey. Okay, so let's talk for a moment about um, carbon capture. Now that's a broad topic. We're gonna to talk about one particular technology today I would call carbon to fuel cells for carbon capture. VJ will have some comments later on other forms of carbon capture. 
But on that uh, picture there, uh, I'll try to make this simple. How does it work? Um, effectively, when you're using a fuel cell, um, which is a making power generally, is a uh, electrochemical process. There's no combustion involved, which is how the emissions are low and you don't have harmful emissions like NOx and SOx and things like that. Um, but what happens here in this case is uh, and typically we would have air and we'd have a fuel, whatever that might be, and we bring it into the fuel cell and the fuel cell basically converts, directly converts hydrogen because we bring in natural gas, if we just use that as an example, we would strip out the hydrogen and then directly convert that to electricity. And basically what you have is you have CO2, very small amount of CO2 and water that is the residual other than the power that you create in the process. Well, when we looked at that, um, we said, look, you know, what if instead of just pure air, if we brought in a stream that contained a higher concentration of CO2? So think about if you have a, a, a gas power plant or any kind of power plant, a coal-fired power plant, you basically have a stream that has oxygen and other things, including CO2 in it, but it's in a fairly dilute state, right? So what might be 5, 15 percent CO2 in there? So the idea here is because we use CO2 in the process, um, and I won't get into the details of that, but basically we're just going to take that stream from the, from the plant and bring that in as our su uh, supply of, of, of basically oxygen. So as we take that same extra CO2 that's coming in with the oxygen through that same process, right, bringing in natural gas, making electricity, basically what we have at the other end of this thing, we still have electricity coming out, right, but we also have water and we have a concentrated stream of CO2, maybe 70%. Now you can do something with that. The key here, though, is on, on any of these things, uh, technically it works. But what you really want to do is you want to try to get as much CO2, the highest percentage recovery of CO2 that you can from the, from the, the power plant itself. So typically we look at 90%. You can do less if you want, and we're trying to do more. So the work we're doing with Exxon is really to try to optimize the amount of concentration okay, or, or reduction. At the same time, we want to make sure that we have an affordable solution. There are other technologies out there, and not, not criticizing them, I think the facts are there, but one of the challenges is that I think everybody would say, if we can do better in terms of reducing CO2, we would. But then all, all of a sudden, if it says, well, what does it cost? And if it cost me, the rate payer, a lot of money, all of a sudden people say, maybe that's not a good idea. So we have to find an affordable, reliable, sustainable solution at the same time. So that's really what carbonate technology using our fuel cells, which are unique to what we do, uh, we do. The second thing, as I mentioned, we can, we can, if we have a power plant that might be 500 megawatts, the beauty of what we do, if you looked at that white box there, is that if you only want to reduce the total by 30 percent, okay, well, you can put in only so many of the fuel cell modules that will reduce it instead of 90 percent, you want 30, okay? So this modular idea really helps people in terms of what their goals are. Rather than build a $1 billion project up front, you can do this on a much more, um, you know, um, pay-as-you-go process but you also don't want to lose the affordability. So I keep coming back to affordability because that's a critical piece of this. So with this technology, you can, one, limit your capital expense, right, in a, in a kind of incremental way, and not lose your affordability because of the fact that while you're reducing the CO2 or concentrating it, you're producing power at the same time. That's, that's the new news. We took this power generation device and adapted it to this application that obviously is near and dear to our hearts on a global basis, by the way, not just because um, you know, of, uh, of some of the things that have happened like COP21 and things, but when you can do better in an affordable way, why wouldn't you do better, right? That's the idea. So again, we can do this with coal plants and gas plants, gas-fired power plants. The difference is the coal plant would have a higher CO2 content on the, on the intake side, maybe 15 percent, versus the plants for, for natural gas might have 5 percent. Same output doesn't make a difference, but the real focus here is on all of the fuels that we're really deriving our power generation from with the concentration because a lot of people are switching to gas today and that has a lower, obviously, carbon footprint. So if we can do better to lower the footprint even more on gas, why not? And that's a lot of the work we're doing here as well. Um, the other thing I would say is that, um, you know, 
when we look at this, uh, as VJ said, we don't want to overpromise and underdeliver, right? And when you've got the, you know, the largest and, and most renowned research organization in the world, and they say, We'd like, we like this idea, this is an area of focus for us, um, you say, you know, when can we talk? And that's kind of how this came together. Our people get together, um, they work very well together. Um, and it's, and it's, uh, it's really a privilege to, to, to deal with, with these folks. So our real goal here is why we're doing research on, on this natural gas because we want to optimize the cycle, make sure we keep the cost low. We're doing other things as well. And again, we have a project with the Department of Energy. And the concept there was that they awarded us a project to do a carbon capture for a coal-fired power plant. And so we're working on that. And when, um, um, as we're doing that, we said, well, can we extend that once we, once we do the coal part portion to do gas? And so when we were talking to, the, uh, to, to VJ and his team and the Exxon people, they said, hey, we, you know, it's, it's basically the same process, and so we'd like to work on this both in a real-life pilot as well as the R&D stage. So Exxon is, um, is, is joining this effort with this DOE project with the DOE's blessing to basically be a critical uh, investor in this project to make it happen. So um, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to VJ to take us a little bit farther down uh, the carbon capture uh, discussion. So um, <clears throat> just to tie back to a couple of the words that uh, Chip said. Uh, so it's a carbonate fuel cell, which, which makes it different versus other fuel cells, which allows us to take CO2 across the substrate and concentrate it. It's modular which uh, allows us to stepwise understand how this, how this works. It generates power uh, versus using power, uh, which means that you're moving forward as you concentrate the CO2 rather than, uh, than going back. Uh, from, a, from a natural gas turbine standpoint, we'll talk about that on the next slide. What I want to talk about right now is we've said power and we've said electricity over and over again. And why are we saying power and electricity? If you look at that pie chart, what that shows is it shows where CO2 comes from in the U.S. And the, the blue and the red are, and it's by, uh, by the number of sites. So how many point sources are there that emit CO2? And if you can imagine, you can think of what, where do you get CO2? Well, you get it from power plants, you get it from industrial operations, you get it from cars, and you get it from just, just, just animals, humans, okay? Well, Power plants, if you look at the blue, that's, that's a little over a thousand sites. And that generates a lot of the CO2. So one of the things when you're trying to concentrate CO2 is you first have to capture the CO2, then concentrate the CO2. So if you have a single point that is emitting CO2, that, that, that is a good place to focus. As you can see by the pie, it isn't the entire solution, okay? That's why we said we have portfolio approaches and we want to understand how exactly to do CO2 capture and concentration. But power plants provide that. Industrial has about five times the number of sites and it still is, is a, also a large source of CO2. But if you concentrate on power, which is what Chip said a few times, why, why do we keep saying power? That's, that simply is why. You have a concentrated source point of CO2 uh, to begin with. Now, as Chip also said, this, this can be done. Um, I'm not going to get into the chemistry on the bottom of the chart, but there is a mean technology that is proven. It's demonstrated out there. We work with the mean technology. We certainly understand it. Um, and what you see there is a natural gas power plant on the left uh, with the CO2 coming off. And of course, uh, it is, it is, you can see the pressures and the temperatures. These are, these are key elements uh, when you think about a chemical process key inputs are what temperature are you at, what pressure are you at, what concentration are you at. These are inputs that we work with and we, and we think about. And as Chip said, that's where a, a gas uh, turbine is going to differentiate itself from a coal, just in terms of the quality of the fluent. Uh, when you start with natural gas, which is cleaner, you have a cleaner effluent. The concentrations are going to be different, but you're going to have a cleaner stream on the back end. So you can see it in a mean plant, which is liquid chemistry. Um, you can see what happens and what the fundamental thing that happened that we need to think about here is it requires energy to run an amine plant. It's not producing energy, it's consuming energy. That's the simple concept that you need to think about here. So while you end up with a highly concentrated CO2 stream, you are putting in a lot of energy and that second phase, you see steam. Steam is heat, steam is warming things, steam is energy. 
And so that second phase, which is sort of the steam stripping, that is where um, you utilize energy, and so you're not generating power. What you are doing with the fuel cell, which I'll talk about just in a moment, is you can actually uh, generate power while you're concentrating the CO2. That's what makes this very exciting for us. And of course, storage, which, which is not the, the primary focus of today's discussion, because it is, it, is, it is an independent process. You have to come up with an efficient way to do the CO2 capture and concentration. Once you have that, storage, quite frankly, has to be done. And we have experience with storage. It's been demonstrated, proven at, at small scale. Uh, but that is still a part of this puzzle that has to be, has to be worked in. Again, this research collaboration we have with uh, fuel cell energy is really focusing on the carbon capture and concentration. So let me turn, I'm doing this slide, right? Let me turn to, well, okay, I just showed you how it's done today with the liquid, liquid amines and things like that. So what does make this different? As Chip said, um, you have a power turbine. What is a power turbine? You, you, for a gas turbine, you, you input methane and air, and basically you're burning to create, right? And what you, the hydrogens give you the power, okay? And what you're left with is the CO2 and the hydrogen that you can see comes out of this. Of course, power comes out of it as well. What you want in the carbonate fuel cell then is it can accept CO2 in the cathode, which is the one half of the carbonate fuel cell. Uh, and what that allows you to do, as you can see, as you follow the diagram, you introduce additional natural gas, introduce additional methane as a fuel. So you take the methane plus the CO2, and you then go through the carbonate fuel cell, and you can see on top, as Chip said, now you have a concentrated CO2 stream and the other materials in with that CO2 are things carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And then now, now we're in a, in a realm of chemistry and a realm of process engineering that we're quite comfortable, okay? Because now we have a concentrated CO2 stream and that CO and hydrogen is, an L, is something called syngas, which is a feed for chemical processes. So you could either use the hydrogen, you could use syngas. Now, now we've got something that from a, from a chemical engineering and a chemical processing, we, we know how to fully utilize every element of this box. So you go to the top, now you have concentrated CO2, which I said would have to go to sequestration, but now I've got a concentrated CO2. I've also produced uh, syngas, carbon monoxide and hydrogen. Obviously, I've made plus electricity, so you can see the electricity coming out. And then you can see through the bottom, you would generate uh, some steam as well through a steam uh, generator. So, so this is very clever. This is very, very unique. There is no other flow scheme, uh, quite frankly, like this. And it is a collection of parts that has been out there. It is, it is just what sort of researchers do. It is taking ideas and, and uh, materials that are out there and reconfiguring them so that you can utilize them in a different way, but utilize them in a way that meets the objective, which is concentrating CO2 while generating power. Um, and you can see some of the elements there in terms of how, how much hydrogen can be produced. But again, the simple concept here to take away from is you put this on the back end of a power plant, of a turbine. You concentrate the CO2 while creating, while generating power and creating some byproducts that could be valuable in other chemical processes. Okay. Okay, so just just in summer before we start with the Q and A, um, so this is a this is a big idea. Um, being able to affordably capture carbon, as VJ said, then there's still some work on sequestration, but without the carbon capture, then uh, becomes a mute point. So it's an important step here that we're taking on today. It's global in nature. We happen to be blessed, obviously, in this country um, with a lot of natural resources. Um, but even with that and uh, the fuel switching and things that's going on, that's fine. But if we can do better, why not? And the same would apply to the rest of the world. Um, so, uh, you know, doing a lot of these different things uh, would be very, very helpful to what the overall goals might be for the planet. Um, we are using commercially available technology, as VJ said. We're trying to optimize the process. You know, you're dealing with the biggest companies in the world, the power industry, things like that. Um, and we're in a position where we don't like to overpromise and underdeliver. Um, this is a serious business, power generation, and we're going to do it the right way. And I think teaming up with the biggest, with the most experience in the world is extremely helpful in making that happen. We talked about affordability without it. It doesn't work. 
We talked about you can incrementally deploy these things over time um, to better utilize your capital. We believe that private capital will be the way to fund this. These will not be necessarily, these will not be funded by the government. Um, we'll put a discussion on carbon tax and things like that, but the way we have the structured, the ca carbon capture piece of this is not really related to carbon tax itself. It is invented in America, which is kind of nice, which gives us an opportunity to create jobs at home, uh, both locally and within our own companies. Um, and um, it, it truly is an opportunity that we do share this besides ourselves with, uh, with Exxon and, uh, and Fuel Cell Energy. We have a lot of collaboration. I mentioned the Department of Energy and other people. Uh, we're really trying to get the best minds in the world to get this to the market. Is, is again, uh, meeting the criteria which you have was efficient uh, and affordable, but also the shortest amount of time possible. So with that, I'll uh, turn it over to, uh, I guess, Sarah for some, some questions. Great. Thank you very much. It's really interesting. Um, so before we open up for questions, and we've got kind of a diverse audience, right? We've got some folks who are interested in policy, some very technology savvy folks, and some people who've been involved in the CCS game for a long time. Uh, so I'm sure we'll have a really good discussion. There's two, two questions I had. The first is uh, focusing on your uh, flow chart just before the summary, right? There is an electricity input, a parasitic load, you know, for the amine approach to, to carbon capture. There's an extra energy input here, though. It's methane. Can you talk about the overall energy balance of a plant that is trying to do this? There's, is, what is the methane requirement to be able to generate that power from the capture component, the fuel cell component of, of the process? Is it, a, is it a great, is it a, a, a large increment of additional gas that's needed for the fuel cell component? Is it quite small? How do you compare that to the, it, the electrical energy input to the, the sort of other process that we're comparing this to? The question was, Sarah, thank you, uh, it kind of relates to the economics, I guess, right? So yes, in a typical um, amine system, which, which obviously there's a lot of experience out there, you effectively can do the same concentration of the CO2. Um, the problem is that, not the problem, but the, you have to build, it's, it's, a, it's a different process, uh, big vessels and things like that, because there's capital involved when you do these things. And then you basically have operating costs because you've got to put you know, electricity and other things into it. The model here is smaller in nature, so the capital cost is lower. Mm -hmm. But the idea is if, if you put in natural gas, you're actually um, creating power. Mm -hmm. And that's where the economics come to play. So, so in a, I'll give you a real simple example that VJ's got up here. If you had a gas plant that's 500 megawatts, and there's a lot of those, yeah. okay, and you wanted to reduce the amount of CO2 or concentrate it um, 90%, you basically would put in 120 megawatts of, of fuel cells, and you'd generate 120 megawatts of power while you were reducing the CO2 or concentrating the CO2. Mm -hmm. Th that's the, the new news there, is there's an economic model there that goes from being a, a cost basis to a, you know, a, mar a profit basis here. And if you think about that, you know, even without the, the, a, a carbon tax, that math works. Mm -hmm. And where that manifests itself is that, you know, at the end of the day, this is a power plant. And typically those power plants would bill these, you know, charges out to the ratepayers. And the ratepayers obviously would like cleaner energy. I don't think anybody would be against that. But the issue becomes, well, what does it cost to meet the ratepayer? And so this gives them an affordable option to do that. Mm -hmm. that that's really the math. So that kind of, it's 120 megawatts of power and the associated gas with that. Okay. Good. To turn this on, Can I, just, I just want to build on that just a moment, um, because your question is actually at the heart of the research. Um, that's what we're trying to understand better. We're trying to optimize. You know, you want to optimize this at a at a bench scale so that you can really understand what the amount of additional methane. You know, a chipset is spot on that you are gaining because you're producing power. Um, and so what you really, what you do in a, in a mean system, in a traditional system, is you, your overall system loses efficiency because you're, you're, adding, you're, you're, adding, you're consuming power as you go. So if your goal is to generate power, which is the goal, then anything that takes you backwards doesn't help. 
what this allows you to do is maintain the efficiency. So you're still as efficient as you were to begin with and you be through the uh, generation of the power. The, the research we're doing is to really understand how best to optimize this. Because you can see there's every, every place where you see a split, you have a decision to make in terms of how do you feed it and, how, and what do you do with the, with the product coming out the other side. That's the essence of the research program. Uh, what we think, as it says up on the chart, what we think is, well, we are very, very confident this is going to net generate power. Very, very confident, okay? And that puts you giant steps ahead because you're already creating something that you want rather than using something that you need, okay? And so by, creating, by generating something we want, we now can look at this and say, how do we optimize this? And that actually is why we're talking as a team today because it's going to take the best scientists from both companies to really understand how to best utilize um, this carbonate fuel cell. But we know we're moving in the right direction for the simple reason the chip said, that you're net generating power. So you're creating something of value rather than using something that you desperately need. Okay. And, and I think that's a really interesting point, especially because, you know, to the extent that you, we've evaluated, you know, whatever 13 large-scale, you know, carbon capture sequestration units that are currently in existence today, I think the majority of them have some sort of enhanced oil recovery component that make the whole thing economic. What you're talking about is making just the proposition of sequestration, excuse me, of capture concentration um, economic in and of itself for power generation units, which you can imagine would be a big deal in places where they don't have a lot of sequestration options. They have a lot of power generation needs, but they would like to figure out a way to be able to also be, uh, what is it, sequestration ready, right? Uh, or, or be able to sequester the, the CO2. Well, and if you, and if you just, to, I just want to make sure we're clear on the math here. But if you look at the clean power plant provisions, right, mm -hmm. they're really looking for a 30% reduction in emissions over a period of time. Mm -hmm. We're over here talking about 90. VJ, exactly right. I mean, we may find out that the optimum is 88 or it's 92. And because it's the, it's the overall cost of this thing, so yeah. there's there's more to this than just materials and and you know gas flow here. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, you may find that you can do more of something in some places and less of something in another place if you're trying to hit an overall goal. Yeah. That's where the modular thing comes in. So we don't want to hurt the economics of it while we're trying to search for the optimum point here. Mm -hmm. So that's that's really what the research is is going to tell us. Mm -hmm. yeah, just just to add on that again, you've. We really want to focus in on the fundamentals here. Um, it, it is, I mean, extrapolation is fun, but fundamentals have won almost every time. And so we really want to make sure that over the next couple of years, uh, while our scientists are working together, and we have checkpoints along the way, uh, but we want to make sure that the fundamentals behind this that will lead to the optimization, but before you optimize, you really have to understand the fundamentals that, 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 that is occurring across this. And that's where some of our advanced analytical techniques that we have in our lab, some of the knowledge that uh, CHIP's team has in terms of the electrochemistry that's going on across the, uh, the substrate here, those things all have to come together. Uh, but, but again, the optimism here is by generating a, a valuable uh, product, power, uh, that's that's really what excites us about this, and now it's now it's just trying to understand how to best how to best do this, and then ultimately, as Chip said, the uh, there may not be just one ideal solution. There may be a solution uh, for a power plant here, maybe a different solution somewhere else. But again, getting the fundamentals so that you can understand what your degrees of freedom are is really at the heart of the uh, of the research program. Just to pull on that really quickly, and I, I know you guys don't want to overpromise and underdeliver, but I, one of the things I think is potentially really interesting about this is that it could, if it works, offend, uh, change sort of the economics of the CCS equation, right? If you don't have a cost component, the largest cost component on the on the concentration side, then it certainly gives you a lot more room to understand carbon pricing on the rest of the equation uh, to be able to sequester the carbon. One of the questions I had for you, Vijay, is on, on this, you keep saying fundamentals, which I know means something very specific to you, but I would like you to talk a little bit more about what that is. And one of the questions I had was, um, uh, years ago, John Deutsch from MIT was here doing one of our events on carbon capture and sequestration, and there was a lot of talk at the time about um, lots of power plants being sequestration ready. You know, and he said, well, you know, my, my driveway is Lamborghini ready, but that doesn't mean there's a Lamborghini <laughs> sitting in it. So the question I have for you guys is, is, is this, is the modular approach, right, the idea that these things will work, you know, well with the units that you put them on, existing units, is, is that part of what you're going to be researching, what kind of interaction the fuel cell 
parallel house with the original plant and, and that sort of thing. Yes. So um, I wish my driveway was Lamborghini ready. Um, <laughs> so uh, I want to just build on one thing before I answer that question, which is, uh, you know, optimism is at, at the core of research. And so researchers have to be optimistic and we have to be ready for it not to work. And then we just dust ourselves back up and go right at it again. Okay, so that's the nature of research. And this is a technology rich industry. And we as a corporation have had a long term commitment to R&D and we continue to do R&D. So it was when you have the backing of your senior management to support research programs and to support programs like this, it, it actually is quite encouraging. So optimism, and if you sense optimism in my voice, you're always going to sense optimism in my voice because that's what we do in research. We have to be optimistic. Now, you hit on, so there's a variety, like, let's just go through it again. There's a lots of reasons why we're optimistic about this, okay, and you hit on a couple of them. Uh, modular is good. The fact that this in itself, before we put the pieces together to say that this could be plugged into the back end of a of a gas turbine and, and be part of the carbon concentration piece, this in itself is a power system. So whenever you're taking a power system with a power system, common sense says that's probably a good thing, okay? So the fact that it's modular, the fact that it's a power generator on its own, um, the fact that the electrochemistry will accept oxygen in the form of CO2, okay? These are all very, very unique attributes of this fuel cell. Uh, there are other fuel cells out there. You, you've heard about them, you read about them, okay? But this is a very, very unique fuel cell. Uh, and so it's, it's, so come back to the fundamentals. That's what we're trying to understand now, okay? So uh, you optimize it for power, you get one way. You optimize it for CO2 concentration, you may get a different way. Uh, you, may, you may have things in series versus things in parallel. These are the types of things. And again, it's just so much easier to do at the small scale and a lot of this work actually will be done up in the Connecticut facilities that, that Fuel Cell Energy has, because their labs are equipped to do this type of work. A lot of the analytical to, uh, uh, work, a lot of the modeling may be done more in, uh, in our facility because we have the, uh, the computer bases and the modelers and things like that. So it's a, it's a collaboration of skills. But to build your point on the fundamentals and what does that mean here, it really does look at, looking at that flow scheme and breaking each one of those apart so we can follow the molecules uh, through the various flow schemes and then try to optimize for power, optimize for concentrated CO2, uh, things like that. And again, this is a very um, idealistic flow scheme you're seeing. Uh, the world isn't quite that idealistic. So ultimately, and why the pilot plant becomes important is because you have to introduce impurities. Chemical processes, uh, industrial processes are not pristine. There are impurities and the impurities are different for coal versus natural gas. Natural gas obviously being cleaner, another one of the advantages of natural gas. You don't have as many of the impurities you have uh, with coal. But as we get into the pilot facility, which again is relatively small scale, but it allows you to introduce uh, some of these impurities so that you can test for the efficiency of the fuel cell as it sees some of these uh, contaminants. So uh, one step at a time, uh, but, but necessary steps. And, and we're, we're going to go as fast as the science allows us to go. So if we see something looking really good, we're not, we're not going to, this, you can't, deadline-based research is very difficult to do. What you do is you have a target and you work towards that target. We're going to stay with this target until we either get there or we fundamentally, again, the opposite, the negative fundamentals, it fundamentally can't do it, okay? And you have to be able to call that as well. But when you call it based on scientific principles, you're a lot more confident that your conclusion is sound. That's why working with fuel cell energy, working with f other folks, we will collaborate as needed to make sure that we run this thing down and we understand this. Meanwhile, as I said earlier, and, and we do want to focus on the fuel cell here, but this is one element of our portfolio. We have other options that we continue to research, and if, if they continue to, if, you know, if they progress and they look promising, we look forward to talking about those here as well. But we've been at this a long time. We're excited about this. We're taking it to the next level. Uh, but I'll say it one last time. Fundamentals is what we're really focusing on the next uh, in the next period. Yeah, maybe just to just to just finish that off. Um, yes, there is a lot of people that say they're ready for carbon capture. Uh, we get calls from all over uh, the world, frankly. Um, you know, our business—it's a little bit of a timing thing, right? I mean, um, our business is building these plants around the world that primarily produce power and thermal energy, and we've done that all over the world. 
Um, what we're talking about here is just modifying the application, if you will, but that modification is, is a big change with a big market opportunity. We're building a pilot plant that's you know, roughly two to three megawatts pilot plant that we'll test both coal and gas on. But as, as you see on the picture here, you know, this is a, a fairly small plant would be 120 megawatts. So when you think about that, you know, we want to make sure we do those fundamentals of EJ say we want to make sure that somebody says, look, I only need 75% reduction. Well, yeah, we, we want to, you know, make sure that the answer is, you know, this is what the life would be, this is what the economics of that would be. So, so the technology itself, as he said, works. What we're trying to do is optimize it for the application of carbon capture. Um, and to do that, you know, we want to make sure because people have done other things and that's fine. And, I'm, and, and there's, it's a big market out there. But at least from our perspective, you know, we're, we're in this to win it. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is that means doing it with the right, you know, the, um, uh, the right team um, with the right fundamentals as we continue to build out our power generation business, which continues to, to go as, as it was before. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got some time for questions. I'm just going to remind you all because we're webcasting. If you're on the walls, uh, wait for a mic uh, to talk and then state your name and affiliation and question in the form of a question. We'll start over here with Amy. Hi, Amy Jordan Basin with the Ramco. Uh, thanks for the really interesting presentation. I was curious, VJ, you've mentioned a few times that you know the carbonate fuel cells are different than other fuel cells. Could you explain some of the differences? And then I also wondered if you guys had any estimate for when you thought this might be able to be a commercial technology or if it's still too early in the pilot process. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks for the question. Um, I'll keep this as simple as possible. What makes this fuel cell different is it can take CO2 as an input. That it, I can't make it any simpler. Um, and so because it's a carbonate, which is a CO3, it requires a different chemistry across the fuel cell, which then allows you to, in theory, plug it right back right into. So as Chip said, what they, when, they're, when they're using it in normal use, it's basically burning methane, and you get the CO2 as part of the, of the burning of the methane. What we said is, well, why don't you break that cycle and insert the back end of the turbine, which will give you the CO2, and see if you can continue to do that. And that's when Chip gets into it. Now we got to understand the life of the fuel cell and the, and the impacts of all that type of stuff, because it is a lower concentration that you're bringing across. So that's it's as simple as I can put it, what makes this chemistry unique and what makes this fuel cell something that we're very interested in. The, the second question is, um, is a much harder one to answer. It's one of those where, as I said, we'll, we'll sort of get there when we get there, uh, and, and, or we won't get there. But either way, we need to understand why or why not. And, um, and along, the, along that journey are a lot of trade-offs. Uh, Chip talked about some of the trade-offs, you know, the efficiency versus the concentration versus, you know, all the, other, all the other elements that have to come. What we have learned over years and years and years of research in our corporation is the more fundamentally sound you can be and the more time you spend on the fundamentals, the more optimistic you are with each, with each next step. And, 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 and that's counter to sort of human nature where you want to go fast and you want to skip a step. Uh, but we've learned that all the way back to second grade, right? That you, you, have, to, you have to take it stepwise and you have to have that patience. Uh, and we do that through very, very um, well aligned with fuel cell energy. What are the, what are the objectives of the next year's program? Uh, we have a governance structure over this uh, joint development uh, where both sides say, yeah, this is probably what we think we can bite off over the next period. And, and, and it's not linear. I mean, research is not linear. Innovation is not linear. Innovation is at the speed that it can be. And typically you hit a, a break point where you say, wow, there really is something, and we go. Uh, like Chip said, over the last several years, we've done the bench scale work, the absolute, absolute minimum, you know, sort of most fundamental lab work to say this does concentrate CO2. Now we go to the next phase, in, in, at the same time we think about a pilot and we, and we go down that journey. But it is, it is years out. I don't, I mean, we really do not want to leave the impression that we're knocking on the door here. It is, it is years out, but we're very, very excited about what we have. Yeah, just to add to that, I guess, sorry, sorry. it's okay. No problem. Um, the word commercialization, I mean, as we view, that, that word means a lot of things to different people. And uh, again, we have an existing business that, you know, we build these plants all over the world now. But what we envisioned of this, just nature of the power business, okay, 
is building plants, fuel cell plants that are in the size of, you know, gigawatts. We'd measure them in gigawatts, right, which is a thousand megawatts. So, you know, I mean, you wouldn't just do one. I mean, the power generation industry in the world is massive, right? So what VGA is talking about is we would do, you know, to, to get to that point, we're doing gigawatt projects all over the world with the utmost confidence and financing lined up and all that. You know, yeah, that's, that's a little ways out for two basic reasons. One is that we still got some, some, you know, work to do on the fundamentals that we talked about concentration. But secondly, you need to build, you know, what does that look like today? Right, I mean, physically, when you, when you have 1,000 megawatts of these things, how do we do it? And that's all part of this. We have a multi, multiple stage relationship here that basically starts with this new application, how do we optimize it? Then once we're gonna build a pilot plant, right? So we're gonna get data on a three megawatt plant. We might build a 25 megawatt plant next before we get to this ultimate thing. But the, but the term commercialization in this space is very different than the term commercialization you might have uh, other places. And that's really because of the scale of this opportunity. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, Chris Knight with Argus Media. Um, I was hoping to find out a little bit more about what you guys meant by like this technology being economic. So if you're producing power with natural gas and it's producing $40 per megawatt hour electricity, on the fuel cell side, would it be $38 megawatt hour or would it be more and how much more? All right, I knew this was gonna come up, good question. Okay, so um, it, it's, it depends. So it's, there's coal and there's gas, and, and the reason there's different economics is because there's different concentrations of CO2 and it has how many megawatts. So if we use a 500 megawatt example, right, and let's use coal because the, uh, if you want to reduce 90% of the CO2 from a 500 megawatt coal plant, you would need to install 400 megawatts of fuel cells to get that, you know, that, uh, that capture. Now, what happens is you've then took a 500 megawatt plant and you now have, you've added 400 megawatts of power. So now you have a 900 megawatt power plant, right? 500 megawatts from coal, 400 megawatts from, from uh, the fuel cells you just you put in there, right? So the way the math was, was set up, we, we look at this not, I mean, the short answer is we can reduce the CO2 at about $35 a ton, okay, give or take. But again, don't take that, that's, if we really, you know, if the volume really goes up, that number goes down pretty dramatically because if you, look, if you looked at those pictures, it's basically, when you looked at a fuel cell, it, it's pretty much material cost. There's, it's 85% of what we do is material cost. So when you get volume, it's a very good leverage and the primary things in that device are basic commodities, stainless steel and nickel, right? So those scale well with volume. But if you stick with just one example here, that's, it's, it's $35 a ton. But the issue is, right, is that what is the rate that the power plant is gonna pass on to the consumer, right? So the, so the world here is, there's no carbon tax here. So what we said was, and, and gas would actually be a better number, but I'll use coal because this is what we did for the DOE and this particular math is public information. But what would really mean is you would be producing, if you get five cents for that power, okay, right? So you got 400 more megawatts. You've already got all the infrastructure from the power plant, transmission lines and everything else, assuming you had gas at that site, and most of them do if they're coal plants, um, that basically it's five cents. So that is a reasonable price by most standards to, you know, um, to, to charge rate payers for that, right? It's not some outrageous number. Now, if you got a coal or, or a carbon tax on top of that, that number drops dramatically. But that's without any, um, you know, other funding from outside of what it actually costs you to build the plant and operate the plant. Okay, okay. that's the affordability piece I was talking about. Yeah. Hi, Richard Campbell, Congressional Research Service. Have you looked at the economics of using a Fisher Trops process on the syngas, or using the syngas to further produce power or reduce the methane inputs? That's a, that's a good question. Um, so that's all part of, when I've mentioned you can produce syngas, I said, well, you can take that syngas and you can get further products out of it using the fisher tow processes as you, as you just described. And that's all part of that old package system, right? So 
you, you, all of those things are going to be um, uh, options once you've concentrated the CO2, right? You could also separate the CO and the hydrogen and utilize the hydrogen uh, as well. So you have all those options. That's what's sort of clever about this about this uh, fuel cell is that not only do you get a concentrated CO2 stream, but that when you have the that first step where you have CO2 plus syngas, you then do a fairly straightforward separation. And then you have uh, the concentrated CO2 plus syngas, which can go into other, uh, other applications. So uh, syngas forward, like you said, is, is pretty well known um, through the fischer tropp process and other, other means. Um, what this particular program is focusing on is, is understanding that concentration of CO2. And then the syngas would go into a different sort of uh, uh, outlet that, that we know um, quite well and we could decide uh, what the best uh, utilization of that is. You're talking about putting, um, so what you want in the carbonate fuel cell is you want the methane, right? When you burn the methane, that's where you're getting your oxygen source. What we're saying is you could use the CO2 uh, to, to f instead of uh, collecting the CO2 from the burning of the methane, you get the CO2 off of the power plant in addition to the methane because you, you have to have both to get the necessary CO2 to make the, uh, to make the chemistry work. Okay. So I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. Could you tell us a bit more about the pilot plant? Yeah, Bob, so um, back in, I guess it was last year, we uh, got a DOE project, it's a, a cost share program, to build a, a 2.8 megawatt uh, power plant um, to reduce uh, uh, on the back of a coal-fired power plant. And we have all different metrics and things, but um, we're, we're basically um, um, have that project, we've been designing for that project. And at the same time, as VJ said, we've been talking to Exxon uh, for, for years on, on their uh, interest, uh, you know, specifically on, on gas. And we, we started thinking about this and we said, you know, there's very similar things here. Um, you know, the concentration is the big differentiator and, and some of the cleanup, you have, there's more cleanup on coal, gas, than obviously from a, you know, from natural gas and the input side. But we said, you know, what if we did all that stuff and, and sized it for both, what would that look like? And we would get a project that would be very efficient um, and frankly, a very efficient use of um, uh, taxpayer dollars because basically the, 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 the DOE, we get a project on, on dual fuel as compared to one fuel. And a lot of people are, are thinking about that right now. If you're, if you're one of the power companies out there today that switch from gas or switch to gas from, from coal, you want to know, is there a solution for gas if I need it in the future? So they thought this was a wonderful idea combined in talking to VJ and his team. You know, Exxon's made an investment on that in that particular project, and um, we have uh, ongoing meetings with potential site hosts, and we, in very short order, would expect to announce the site, and our teams are working on the design issues and, and all the details of implementation. Great, great. Yeah. Um, Elizabeth McGowan with Energy Intelligence, and I wanted you to to explain why you're making the announcement now, because this carbon sequestration has been around. I mean, we have discussed this and discussed it, and then we have these, everyone gets optimistic, oh, don't worry, we can keep using fossil fuels because this technology is floating out here. And then you tell us, oh, it's years off. I mean, it's, it's a little, it's a roller coaster, and I wanna know why June or May of 2016. And the other thing, if you could talk about the funding, you mentioned earlier, oh, this is going to be all private funding, but DOE is in, could you talk about that? Because I think it's important. Nobody wants to pay for this. It's expensive, but yet our tax dollars are going toward it. So could you talk about the fall line with public and private money? Yeah, let me start with in the reverse, and I'll try to remember the first question when I get there. Um, so yes, I mean, DOE has not just this program, but they have other programs on some advanced technologies to do these kind of bigger, you know, global type things. Um, that's true. We participate in that particular program. But what I was talking about is that part of that is that we need to have on an ongoing basis, if you're going to be implementing this around the world and certainly domestically, 
you know, you want to have economics that could attract private capital. You know, the government, we're not expecting the, gov the government beyond this basic research to do any of this stuff, which is what you want, because if you wait for that, that's a, if you can imagine how big this potential is, that would be a problem. So we have to make sure, as Vijay said, this is optimized, right? It is, it is reliable, because when you're trying to attract private capital, they want two things. They want certainty, and they want a return. So it's really critical that we make sure that these other fundamental things, as he mentioned, the scalability, et cetera, we have in place. Uh, your the first question was, I think the first question was enthusiasm. Yeah, I, I think whether it's, you know, one, you know, it's been going on for quite some time, and uh, I, I think the answer is that, you know, it's, it's hard to, to schedule innovation, and sometimes people's enthusiasm gets ahead of what they can deliver. And the reason we haven't made a big deal about this, we, we've had a contract with, with, <laughs> with our friends at Exxon for many years, we didn't want to bring it out because then we'd be like, oh, is this the coming? Look, this is a serious business, both from a safety perspective, it's large, okay, you're dealing with the biggest companies in the world, people uh, can be affected by this. So we have, we have downplayed this, frankly, because we want to make sure this really works, okay? Um, there's, there's, it's a great solution. Technically, VJ would tell you it's worked. His folks have crawled all over this. They're smarter than us. Um, the answer is, can you optimize it to make it affordable so we don't have another one of these situations where people get all excited, you know, and it just doesn't work mathematically. I think the big thing here is the math has to work. Because if, if, if this becomes a push thing or somebody else has to pay for it, I think you're going to find it somewhat limited in its deployment. And we want to get beyond those years, frankly. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, VJ, go ahead. Let me just, uh, from our perspective, you know, you asked why talk about it in 2016. I mean, we, we don't talk about things until we have some degree of confidence that, uh, that there is a fundamental behind why something will or will not work. It was also going to another phase of an agreement with, uh, with fuel cell energy, which said this is probably the time to get out there and, and talk about it. Uh, the, the work up until this point has been uh, relatively small and really focused on just, uh, like I said, lab scale experimentation. Um, our primary interest continues to be in the fundamentals. I've said that a few times. Uh, the pilot work is something that we're just, we're leveraging work that fuel cell energy was doing and looking at a way to, to learn more about how this works in, a, um, in more of an industrial setting. Uh, but the thing is, is that's, gonna, that's years out. That's not going to happen immediately. The lab work has already started. So we came out with the announcement uh, first week in May, I think, first week in May. And uh, the lab work, the teams were already collaborating on the fundamentals. And that work is going to, in, in, in turn, impact uh, anything that's done at the pilot phase. So there's a nice synergy between them, but uh, uh, please understand from our perspective, it is about the fundamentals, and the reason we came out with the announcement in May is because we're taking it to the next phase of, of experimentation, and when you're working with a company like Fuel Cell Energy, we felt like it was important to talk about uh, the collaborative work that we're doing together, and, that, and that's what drove the timing. Yeah, hi, Dave Ramaswamy, Indus Latin Ventures. My question is to Chip. In emerging markets like uh, in Africa and in India, uh, what's the opportunity to co-locate your fuel cell stack, if you will, on the top of some waste to energy projects? Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's lots of opportunities. Um, there's just a couple of basic things you have to make sure you have in place right to do this. I mean, if you have a coal plant, it could be in China, India, wherever it might be, um, you, you have to have some form of methane. It could either be biogas or it could be natural gas. But if you, you basically, if you have that source of fuel um, and you have the physical space to obviously do this, uh, you can basically build these downstream of the current coal plant and call it, you know, a retrofit project. So you would get more power out and you would get the emissions reductions. Um, in gas plants, you can do it either on a retrofit basis or you can do it um, on a combined integrated basis, which is really a lot of the discussion we're having with, with Exxon because there's some efficiency benefits you get from doing that, which is some details, but there are some benefits of doing it in an integrated fashion as compared to a retrofit fashion. 
So those are, you know, the question is, do they, you know, what is the price of power that they pay? Do they have those fuels? What is it? You know, how much can you get? But yeah, I mean, this is a global opportunity. And what's interesting about this is, you know, you know, you might be a country that has resources of X, right? I mean, if you're in India, you have coal. You know, going forward, do they need power? Yeah. Do they want a cleaner? Yeah. Are they going to use the coal? Perhaps they might. In other places, it might be, it might be very different. So I think it's all about, you know, what makes economic sense as you're trying to reduce these greenhouse gas emissions. That's really the goal. The one thing that may not have come up, again, the feed to the fuel cell requires a methane. It requires whether it comes from biogas, whether it comes from natural gas. So even in the coal configuration, the difference, the fundamental difference between the coal configuration and the, and the natural gas configuration, in the natural gas configuration, it is natural gas. It's natural gas. It's methane feeding the turbine. It's methane feeding the fuel cell. It's a, it's a constrained system using only methane. The coal system would, would have the coal, but you'd still have to have the methane into the uh, into the fuel cell, and I'm not sure that came across as clearly uh, in, in the, in the uh, differentiation between the two uh, in the two processes. Chip and BJ, I want to thank you very much for coming today to talk a little bit about this technology. I hope you'll come back uh, as you learn more about the fundamentals and the economics. I think these are big questions, as BJ, as you said really well, only part of a portfolio of options that are going to have to be explored in, er in order to sort of crack the code of uh, affordable transitions to a low-carbon future. And, uh, and But we're very excited about it and hope to hear more about it as it goes along. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, sir.